So we got through the challenge for the 12th Wiki Tree Challenge of 2022. And of course, our guest star was Hugo Award winning fantasy and science fiction author Lois McMaster Bujold. And I know we definitely had some fans in the crowd that were going back and forth between reading books and <laughs> doing some research. Good for them. Yeah. And I'm sure you're ready to see what we found now. I know uh -huh. one person you were interested in knowing more about was your paternal grandmother. And that was Pearl Margaret Beaver McMaster. Yeah. About whom I heard nothing in my childhood because she died in like 1916 or 18. Yeah, really. Yeah. The dates. She married Charles Royal McMaster. I love his name. And he did go by Royal, not Charles. So she had first appeared in a sentence census in 1900. She was about 15. She was attending school in South Huntington, Pennsylvania. Her father, 39, worked as a stone cutter and paid a mortgage on their home. Her mother was also 39, took care of the home and family. She had bore 10 children, but only five were living. So, you know, that, that has just had to have been tragic for her mother. Oh, yeah. The death, the kids' death information on 19th century and earlier by uh, genealogy stuff is just heartbreaking. But yeah. yeah, it really is. And it was so much more common then. Uh, her siblings, John, Howard, Clarence, and Helen were in the home. Uh huh. Now, the following year, when she was just 16, her father died of grip, which is a flu-like symptoms, you know, and that was um, what they called it a lot of times when people died of the flu and they really didn't know what else to say about it. And so Pearl and three of her siblings took jobs to pay the bills. She worked as a sales lady. John and Howard worked as contractors and 15-year-old Clarence apprenticed as a painter after school. Only her sister, Helen, 13 at the time, attended school and didn't hold a job. They'd also taken in a boarder, a stenographer named Wallace. And there's actually no house that remains. This is the lot on the left there that Pearl had lived in with her parents and the home is no longer there. So not only was she not around to make memories, you know, and tell her story and her father's story, who died young, but the house that used to be there is not there anymore. Huh. Now, at the, at the age of 27, of course, we said she married Charles Royal McMaster. They lived in West Newton, Pennsylvania, where oh. he worked as a shipping clerk for the electrical company. Okay, so, yeah. worked yeah. for Westinghouse later. Uh, yeah, he worked at Westinghouse for a long time. Uh, their mm -hmm. son, Robert, was born a, a year later, just two days after their first wedding anniversary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then they were blessed with a daughter two years later. So, of course, here we have uh, Robert Charles McMaster's certificate of birth, and we have the application for mm -hmm. that marriage license. Okay. Yeah, and something. they actually did a pretty nice job, you know, uh, get, gathering a lot of information from it. Now, of course, there wasn't a whole lot else to find on her. She died at the age of 30 from an infection she gained after childbirth. So I just, six, yeah, just 16 days after her daughter was born. Mm -hmm. Her brother-in-law, brother oh. Arthur McMaster, and his wife, Matilda, took Pearl in. Royal and six-year-old Robert moved in with his mother. So Royal took Robert with him, but, you know, it's understandable that um, a female baby, you know, especially an mm -hmm. infant, he would give to somebody that, that has a woman in the home to oh, help yeah. take care of. <clears throat> and then, excuse me, the children are reunited, reunited finally by 1930. So they were both living with their father and their grandmother in Wilkinsburg by 1930. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, then, tell me again the name of the person who took, her, took uh, Ethel in. Uh, that would be Arthur McMaster and his wife, Matilda. Okay. And did, I knew Arthur's name, but I'd never heard Matilda. So that's a new one. And that's pretty close. Yeah. And then Royal lived on for another 53 years, never remarrying that we could see. We didn't see any kind of another marriage certificate. So that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Lived long enough to, for me to meet him. So he died when I was a teenager. Oh. 
here's an ancestor that you knew about, but you expressed interest in whether the line was proven. So, you know, of course, Rebecca Town Nurse is known. Her name is known by a lot of people that have researched history around Salem. And, um, you know, following the line, though, to see if it's a proven line was, mm -hmm. is, you know, was what we did. One of the things that we do instead of just going, oh, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> uh, we want to look at it. So yeah. you're, we're going to step back through until we get to her. And to do this, we went back to your great grandparents on the Thayer line. And that Samuel Langton Giroux and his wife, Laura Etta Thayer Giroux. Now we right. know he attended yeah. Dartmouth College and then seminary school. He mm -hmm. was ordained after his first marriage to Lucy Merriam, and he enlisted in the 14th New Hampshire in Infantry during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. When his first wife Lucy died, of course, he remarried to your great grandmother, Laura Thayer. He had, Samuel had one child with Lucy, a daughter named Mary Clementine. With his second wife, Laura, he had seven children. Mm -hmm. So. I saw that information in the Gerald genealogy, which he compiled, incidentally. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Pictures. And then here, yes, he saw the importance of preserving our history and putting that scrapbook together, oh, you know, which also contained the town's history. And I know he had called out to the town's members, um, you know, to add their own information to that and, you know, just stressing how much history was uh, important. Oh, there's a picture of him in the Civil War years. Oh, I should have had that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll send these to you if, just in case you don't have any. And we tried to put the pictures in there that we could find. So. I have, no, I don't have all of them. No, I don't have any of those, I don't think. And he and Laura lived out long lives. He died at the age of 71, her at the age of 88. Six of their joint children survived them, as did uh, Samuel's daughter that he had had with Lucy. And then... One daughter he had lost at the tender age of 15 days. So mm -hmm. once again, those baby deaths are so sad. From there, we go through Laura's parents, uh, Warren and Permelia Thayer. He was a successful farmer and a deacon. She was said to be a devout and praised mother and wife. They had eight children, all raised in New Hampshire. Laura lived to the age of 77, Warren to 92. And I thought it was really cool, you know, that we actually found those comments uh, that were saying what a wonderful person the wife was, because mm -hmm. generally you just hear about the men, you know, mm -hmm. and what they do. And then that square is um, Permelia Sampler. That's a sampler that she cross-stitched. Okay. That's so yeah, I, thought, I mm -hmm. thought that was really cool. Yeah. The uh, Gerald family and the New Englanders generally kept way more records than any other quadrant of the family. Uh, yeah. Yep. So, so from then we go on and now we're moving to Permelia's grandparents, Philip Nurse and Anna Putman. These connections were easily proven. The records in Salem, Massachusetts were really easy to find, um, you know, but Massachusetts as a whole generally has a pretty good, um, grasp of you know maintaining their records they haven't lost them like some of the states where you know whole sections of records are, are gone mm -hmm. now philip had initially married his second cousin sarah putnam and had four children with her and then when she died he married her sister Anne and had five children with her okay so another big family happened that way then we go to past Philip's parents, Francis and Eunice Putnam. And for that generation, they spelled it Norse instead of nurse. Um, we mm -hmm. did see it both ways in those older records. They had yeah. nine children. And records about the woman who was judicially murdered in, uh, in uh, Salem. Continue. Yeah. We did find both spellings. Um, it's also noted that there was a third spelling in Massachusetts, and they did notate in the records. N-U-S-S, -S. so you were supposed to look at all three spellings in order to find the records. Yep. And then Rebecca Town Nurse, and I know you know all about her, but um, other people that watch your, your interview may, may not know all of it. And her early life was remarkable only by the journey that her family made to settle early in New England. They mm -hmm. had most likely arrived in 1639. 
she married John Nurse about 1644 in Salem. And it said they had eight children with the last being born in 1666. And then it wasn't until 26 years later that a group of young girls accused several of the local women of witchcraft. And for those that don't know, a wave of hysteria spread through the colonial Massachusetts and a special court was convened to hear the cases of more than 150 men, women and children. And Rebecca was actually one of the first to those implicated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, there's some interesting articles on uh, Wikipedia, the most readily accessible uh, uh, descriptions of what went on, which I which I have read in the past, is pretty pretty awful. It really I, is, um, you know. It, it and I didn't realize she was, you know, until we looked into it more, um, that she was so p- far past childbearing age. So it's not even like, um, you know, one of the young to middle aged women that were gossiping and you know finding little things mm-hmm. to pick at each other. At the, I mean, this was somebody that was getting on in her years, you know, she was well established. Everybody liked her, obviously, except for those few people. Um, and, you know, and then that happened anyways. Really horrific. One of the things I'd read about her before I was sure of the connection, uh, which you have just proved, thank you. Uh, now I have <laughs> kind of an ancestor to brag about. People brag about. <laughs> Ancestors who were hanged as highwaymen. Uh, but uh, at any rate, um, yeah, one of the things said about her was that she was deaf when she was tried, rather deaf, and couldn't really hear what was going on. Huh? So she did not make yeah. good responses. Huh? Yeah, and, and she seemed a little confused, you know. And of course, being mm-hmm. up in her olden years, it may have just been that, just age also. Um, she didn't yeah. un- well, seem to understand yeah. who these people were and why these charges were being taken seriously. Mm-hmm. Now, before we move on to the next ancestor, though, we're going to take a look at some of the parties involved. And yeah. this was interesting. So Sarah Bibber was one that, of course, accused many people of witchcraft and said she knew all details about their spells to raise the devil. And one of those people she accused was Rebecca. So to counteract that, Rebecca's sister, Sarah, testified that she watched Sarah Bibber prick herself with pins from her clothes and then say Rebecca had harmed her. So even with a witness um, saying that she'd seen Sarah do this to herself, it didn't help. Two of her daughters and a son-in-law also testified on her behalf. Now, when the arrest warrant was written out, it was said that Rebecca committed much hurt and injury to the body of Ann Putnam. The warrant against her is what you see on the left. And Hmm. of course, there was no real proof that she had harmed Anne in any way either. And poor Rebecca was just still confused about the whole thing. And then the final person on the list, this one's of interest to you, is Joseph Hutchinson. And he was one of the first accusers of Rebecca and the other women that the initial warrants were out. And of course, he sat on that special court that was convened. So to go back to the proven lines where we were at Philip Nurse and his wife, Anna Putman, instead of going off to um, Samuel Nurse, we're going to go off to Eunice's mother, who was Bethiah Hutchison, and she was the granddaughter of Joseph Hutchinson. So he's also an eighth great grandfather of yours on the Thayer line. Oh, dear. So so your eighth great grandfather... Joseph Hutchinson accused your eighth great grandmother, Rebecca Nurse, of being a witch. Okay. <laughs> but all right. I know. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> it's funny how the their just dis- the descendants wind up marrying and making those connections. And later on, we're mm-hmm. like, oh wow, we had people on both sides. Oh, you know, yeah. I had one of the judges and I had one of the supposed witches. So yeah. Yeah, so that's strange. Yeah, we never heard about him in the family tracking. Uh, yeah, we, we had to do some careful um, tracking to double check the, the uh, connection for that. And it was it was true. And of course, she threw herself at the mercy of the court and she was executed anyways. And, you know, it was almost 20 years before uh, her name was cleared and it was accepted that she was innocent. Yeah. But there were just so many of them. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a nutsoid thing. Uh, anyway, you have more. 
we have more. We have another really interesting one. And this is one of your a little bit closer, fifth great grandmothers, Anna Weyerbacher, Hannah, and her sister Elizabeth. Now, this one goes on your mother's side of the tree to her mother, Pauline Hetrick Jerome, her mother, Elizabeth Coleman Hetrick, to her mother, Susan Drummond Coleman, okay. and then to her mother, Jane. And it goes finally from Jane to her father, Daniel, and out to Anna Weyerbacher. So she's still out there, um, but, you know, she's she's mostly off that maternal line that comes from uh, Lord Gerald. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, Anna, Anna and Elizabeth Weyerbacher were two of the, there were at least seven children bo born to Johannes Weyerbacher and Anna and Katharina Bess Weyerbacher. And they moved to Northumberland, Pennsylvania in 1775 in what then was part of the frontier. They led a quiet life in Buffalo Township, tending to their small farm with its two horses and three cows. Times were turbulent for all of those during the American Revolution. So to add to the tension, the Iroquois nations had sided with the British and didn't welcome those that were on the frontier that were fighting for a new country. So mm -hmm. as Anne's family had heard of an impending slaughter, there was a rumor going around, they joined the others and what was later said to be, um, you could only call it a stampede of families where people had just grabbed up what they could carry and they were all wildly fleeing the valley. They just were sure the Indians, you know, the Native Americans were gonna come in and, and slaughter them. Mm -hmm. And of course it didn't happen. So it, there, there were some incidents that happened, um, but that particular one didn't. And by late 1780 or 1781, her family had moved back to Buffalo Valley to farm. Hmm. That little particular area of Buffalo Township is among the oldest settlements in Butler County. So before the reorganization in 1854, it was one of the largest townships in the county, being nearly nine miles in length and eight miles in width. The southern part of the township being heavily timbered was considered the most desirable and the agriculture thrived there. So the sketch that you see, there's also, there's actually several of these that are from uh, that township in that era. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know whose houses, you know, which houses whose, but these were sketches that were done at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in 1781, while most of the family was out working the farm, Anna and her sister Elizabeth had stayed back behind. They were 14 and 16. So they may have been doing other tasks, you know, um, cooking, washing clothes, whatever it is that needed to be done by young girls at that time. But the turbulent times were not quite over and the girls were seized by the natives that had raided the farm. They set fire to the cabin before they left, taking both of the young girls with them. And the fire consequently was the first thing that was noticed. They wouldn't have noticed so soon that the girls were gone if they wouldn't have seen the smoke rising from the house. But they got back too late to stop them. Now, Anna escaped a few days later and made her way back to her family, but her sister wasn't with her when she arrived. Mm -hmm. And so the initial tales of the abduction all stated that Elizabeth was never heard of afterwards. Hmm. But in fact, her father had located her after the war was over. And it was interesting, you know, he had heard a rumor that, um, you know, this tribe had two young ladies, uh, white young girls <clears throat> in their midst after the war was over. And him and some of the other dads that also had daughters missing, you know, decided to go travel out there and look for them. And they made the journey and they got out there. And of course, there is, you know, one of the girls that stayed back with the, the Native Americans was his daughter, Elizabeth. And he had talked to her and said, you know, I, I want to bring you home. Well, this is several years after she's already been there. And they uh, told her that, you know, if if these men come and they actually take you girls back home, I'm telling you that they will be slaughtered on their own home. They will not be allowed to live. They cannot hmm. take what is ours. And so what the lore is, is that she said, 
um, you know, I don't want anything to happen to you, father. So I'm just going to stay mm -hmm. and just know that I'm safe. And she actually wound up becoming the wife of a chief, the mother of a large family. And she lived beyond the age of 80 and she wow. just stayed there. That is captives not wanting to go back is not an uncommon story. You hear it uh, repeatedly uh, in these kinds of incidents from the period. So it's a complicated, complicated times. Yeah. Emotionally and otherwise. Yeah. And especially after seven years, you know, and if they're not actually captive by that time, they're just actively living in that community. Mm -hmm. um, you have to stop and think how much did they accept that as now being their home. Yeah. And you know, have to think about you know what did they come from, and was it really all that much better, yeah, you know, for for some of these women, uh, the lives that they were leading within their families. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, life on the frontier was not easy, you know, for for any of them, for the men out trying to work the farm, for the women that are out trying to help the men work the farm, and you know, raise the family. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the work is incredible. Yeah, these are the headstones for Adam, and I'll send you a better picture of it, and also for Anna. Uh, they had at least four children. They raised them all there in Butler Township. Now, after everything that happened with that, she had tragedy later in life, and I just feel for this woman and her family, you know. It, it was just seems like it was several things that really set them back. Her and Adam had had a set of twins, and so she rode out with four month old little baby Anna and her husband, Adam carried the twin Adam Jr. on his horse and they set out for the day. Well, they got to the Creek and went to cross it and Anna's ho horse slipped and her and baby Anna went into the Creek. Ooh. So, yeah. So Adam was able to hang on to little Adam you know, and get him out of the creek to safety, but he couldn't do that and save his wife. And hmm. so Anna and the four-year-old Anna uh, both perished in the creek. Hmm. So many drownings. People were not taught to swim back then. Yeah, right. I know. And you don't know. I mean, if it's just, was she not swimming? Um, you know, did she get knocked into the rocks? I mean, you just have no way of knowing, but there's no way he could have held the baby and kept him safe and still, you know, pulled the wife out. I don't mm -hmm. know, but she was only 27 when she died. So he was eventually buried next to her in the night cemetery in Haynes Township. Huh. And it it's looks a, like both of their stones are in German. Ha -ha. Okay, yeah, I know the, the Hetrick side uh, was German, you know, German descended Western Pennsylvania farmers. Hmm. So here we have another one, another set of eighth great grandparents for you. And this is Henry Adams and his wife, Edith Squire. They are eight great grandparents through your Gerald line. Now, this is going way back there. So Henry and Edith married in 1609 in Charlton Mackerel, Somerset, England. He was a distiller of spirits and a farmer. They okay. arrived in New England. Yeah, <laughs> you, had a, you had a distiller. Yeah, all right. They, they arrived in New England in 1638. They traveled with seven sons and a daughter. And then another son that was adult uh, sailed and joined them later. And they were actually one of the uh, earliest settling families of Mount Wollaston, Massachusetts. Okay. Yep. They say he was known popularly as the founder of New England because of his extraordinary number of grandchildren. There were 89 of them. <laughs> Good heavens, a lot I of people in ancestor then. Right, um, definitely some big families. Uh, I couldn't keep track of 89 grandchildren. I just don't know what I would do. Uh, he and his large family preferred uh, settling near the coast. And so they wound up staying in Braintree, Massachusetts, which is now known as Quincy. He hmm. died on the 6th of October, 1646, and was buried on the 8th of October. 
His will is dated in 1646 and was proved in June of 1647. And it mentions his wife, Edith, and all but the three oldest children. They had nine children in all. Hmm. So he had probably given stuff to those, you know, the older children when they had moved out already. But a monument was erected by his grave by his descendant, John Adams, the second president of the United States. Good heavens. And it's inscribed as follows. In memory of Henry Adams, who took his flight from the dragon persecution in Devonshire and alighted with eight sons near Mount Wollaston, one of the sons returned to England and after taking time to explore the country, four removed to Medfield and the neighboring towns, two to Chelmsford. Only one, Joseph, who lies here, his left hand remained here, who was an original proprietor in the township of Braintree, incorporated in 1639. This stone and several others have been placed by a great-great-grandson from a veneration of the piety, humility, simplicity, prudence, patience, temperance, frugality, industry, and perseverance of his ancestors in hopes of recommending an imitation of their virtues for posterity. Hmm. People tracked their ancestors in that quadrant. They really did. Yeah. So, see, you have some several um, very well-known ones <laughs> <laughs> that you maybe haven't heard about because, you know, so much has been done on the Gerald line, but maybe not on the others. Mm-hmm. Now, we and know it's not just... Always get the women's yeah. lines just kind of get lost in the shuffle. Go ahead. Yeah, we know that men brave the frontier and face hardships, but, you know, Edith raised those nine children while caring for the home in a new country and except for a sister that migrated edith had to help build and support a new home with no family around them she continued to tend to the family and the land for five years on her own after henry's death finally remarrying to john fessel edith lived to the age of 84 john lived for another four years he actually died at the hands of the wapanoag tribe during a raid he was 101 years old Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. I said to my husband, I said, how old was he going to be if they didn't come in and kill him at age 101? 102, maybe. <laughs> 110. I, he might have walked around for another nine years. You don't know. Um, that was pretty incredible, though. And just the fact that the wife made it, you know, so long and so long on her own, because I know not only do the women's stories get shuffled to the side, but of course, the women weren't weren't thought to be able to take care of themselves um and you know yeah take care of a home (laughs) and the family and she obviously did just fine until somebody convinced her that marrying would be good um but yeah she had to have been a really strong woman there's a bunch of them in the family tree actually i know yeah here's more Yeah, you had you had a lot of incredible ones. Now, this one, after touching briefly on an ancestor that was a distiller, um, I just wanted to make a nod to Johannes S. John Bieber, which is alternately, of course, Bell Beaver. He was one of your fourth great grandfathers. And so we followed your father's side of the tree. To get to the final John, we went through his mother, Pearl, Margaret Beaver McMaster, then to John H. Beaver. On to Jonathan H. Bieber, or Beaver. He spelled it both ways. Then to his father, DeWalt Bieber. And I noticed that those were some pretty popular common names. So there were a lot of Johns, and there were a number of DeWalt sprinkled sprinkled in there. Okay. Making sure you've got the right one must be a challenge for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, then you're hoping they list the wives because, (laughs) because so many Johns and Jonathans. It was just, it was a lot. Now, John was one of the 12 children born to DeWalt Bieber and Sibelia Steinbrenner Bieber. Once out on his own, John married and bought some land to farm. He started with a simple 150 acres. He had two horses, three cows, and four sheep. His wife, Susanna, died before 1799 as he married a second time. Now, he and his wife, Catherine, had six children. 
and he now had increased his property that he and he owned 237 acres of land. Any kids, you would need that much land. I know you definitely would. Yeah. And you'd need the cows and the, you know, the milk and the chickens for the eggs and, mm -hmm. and everything just to feed him. So John continued to live a quiet life in Maxitani. He paid his taxes. He served on a jury and he even signed a petition supporting his friend, John Kemp's petition to run an inn in his home. And it wasn't until John's probate file that we got further details. He had, John had 10 children in all, the exact amount of his siblings. His real estate in 1846 was valued at $13,411, which was quite a bit of money back then, to put, you oh, know. Yeah. He also owned, this was interesting, five beehives. You don't see a lot of mention of beehives back, you know, in the day, but people had to have them. The way they got sweets, it was, a, it was an excellent food source. Everybody mm. kept meat. And then additionally, he had a copper barrel kettle, which was found in his belongings, which was generally used for distilling spirits. So, mm -hmm. you know, it begs the question, did he produce spirits for that friend John Kemp's inn? Um, did he sell spirits to help support his family? We'll never know that unless a descendant comes forward with a family tale or some family lore. But what we do know is he was a successful farmer who cared for his family until the end and beyond. Hmm. And then you have many ancestors and relatives that served in the military. And here are just a few that served in the Civil War. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of these, but we definitely yes. like to... Three. I know about three. Beyond that, I know nothing. So continue. <clears throat> and, you know, and a few we're looking at um, might not be direct either, but we really like to, to recognize and acknowledge our veterans. Your great grandfather, Samuel Langdon, Gerald served in Company G of the 14th New Hampshire Infantry. Mm -hmm. And it looks like his last rank was sergeant. Hmm. Your second great grandmother's brother, Gawain Drummond served in Company E of the 206 Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. Uh -huh. Your second great grandmother's other brother, Andronicus Drummond, served in Company F, 206th Regiment, Pennsylvania Infantry from 1861 to 1865. Huh. And then three of your great grandmother, Laura Etta Thayer's brother, served in various uni units. So <laughs> William McClure Thayer served in Company A of the 117th New York Infantry. Leonard Edward Thayer served as a sergeant in Company K of the 96th New York Infantry. And then Hiram Orcutt Thayer served in Company A of the New York Infantry, and he died from wounds five weeks after mustering in. Hmm. Yeah, the thing I saw about the uh, 14th, New Hampshire 14th, was about twice as many people, men died of disease than of wounds. It was kind of an interesting statistic. Uh, yeah, given, that is. Given Martin's experiences as a doctor, but carry on. Yeah. Well, yeah, and conditions and medical care and, you know, just such a combination of things back then. Mm -hmm. Now, your second great grandfather, Lauren Thayer's nephew, Charles Edward Tupper, served in Company G of the 2nd Vermont Infantry. He died in a regimental hospital in 1861 from typhoid fever. Yep. That would have uh, taken a lot of them. A nephew of your third great grandmother, Jane Hennig, served during the Civil War in the 138th Pennsylvania Infantry. So you had a lot of Pennsylvanian ones. And he died in 1863, age 28, in Locust Grove during the Mine Run Campaign, which was an unsuccessful attempt of the Union Army of the Potomac to defeat the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Mm. So definitely want to thank them all for their service and anyone that we have missed on this tree. <laughs> <laughs> now on Wiki Tree, we're all cousins by blood or marriage. Once we're connected to the global tree, 
Um, you know, we can check on anybody and see how many steps it is to, or, you know, whether you're a direct cousin to somebody. And right now there are 26,284,283 people connected. So hmm. we're just going to take a look at a couple on of you. Tree altogether, not necessarily to me. Well, if I'm on Waking Tree, we're connected. Yeah. Now, you asked about John Locke, the philosopher. He's mm -hmm. a cousin, but it's quite a stretch. So John uh, is your ninth cousin, 11 times <laughs> removed. At that point, it is. Yeah, yeah. it but really it was, is. In the family, you know, somebody thought it was a connection. So. I just think it's cool that our software will do this now. You know, it just, it'll look so far back for a connection. I have, I'm very vague on how cousins and cousins removed and cousins num or numbered you know actually works but you probably yeah your tips yeah and if you do if you look on the charts um on WikiTree, it it'll show you every step along the way every person that's in between you and them and then you can see if it jumps a line by marriage now mm -hmm. this is your first cousin four times removed so not as far away john alby and he was interesting he was known as a unitarian minister he turned into a transcendental poet known for his friendship and his correspondence with Ralph Waldo Emerson, among others. He published a memoir that included his mother's stories about his grandmother, Holda Thayer Alby, which is your fourth great grandmother. He described her as a large stout woman who wore an immense bonnet that flared white in the front and big bowed silver spectacles. And he was interesting. Um, one of the people that, you know, that he knew was Edison. And there's a story by a uh, daughter or granddaughter of his about how he had stood there and they did the two can type things with a string, you know, trying to figure out how to make the phone work when he first came up with the concept. And, you know, one would yell, can you hear me? And the other one's like, yeah, Edison I can hear Bell. you. And yeah, yeah Alexander, Alexander Bell, Bell. So Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah. So which yes. one was he friends with? He was friends with a um, with a number of them. Alexander Bell. He was uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he was friends with a lot of them. So, yeah, okay. And then, and I'll send you the um, I'll send you the profile on him so you can see what all is on there. Now, John Adams was born 19 October 1735 in Braintree. See, hmm. daughter of a prominent family. They had five children in yeah. 10 years. Stillborn daughter in, daughter in 1777. Um, he was the second president of the United States. And that is John and Lois are four cousins, four times removed, or first cousins, four times removed. Okay. So, yeah. That was, that's new. John Steinbeck was another connection. And he, of course, is an American author, best known for his novels, The Grapes of Wrath and Of Mice and Men. Typ huh. It's typical of his focus to be on the plight of the downtrodden. And you and John are first cousins, four times removed. Uh, there's also new information. So those are fun. You know, there's um, other people you can look at in the future and uh, I'll give you the instructions for it. You can just say, hey, is this person related to me if it's on WikiTree? And I'll tell you if they are and how far away. So uh, for the final thing, I just want to take a minute to mention a few top people during your challenge week. Now, Karen Lowe is your captain and she led your research team. She did an incredible job keeping everybody motivated and going. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris O'Connell was the top scorer and he added 90 profiles. So 90 ancestors to your branches during that one week. And we had Homer Thiel, who was the top bounty hunter. And he found some really great information out within the leaves. So, you know, there will mm -hmm. be a few more things and I will send you what we have on them. And, you know, you can take a look. Of course, I, I can never fit it all into the presentations, but. Yeah, I, it sounds like you found way more than I was expecting. Yeah. Uh, so we had the McMasters. How, how far did you get with the McMasters? Let me bring them up.
It looks like we just took it to James McMaster 1801. Um, we didn't have enough information to see where he could have come from in Ireland. I know we saw some stuff online that where people had, you know, speculated that he may have come, um, but we couldn't find any proof on where the actual location was. So we mm -hmm. didn't get to jump the pond for the Ireland <laughs> McMasters. I know they came down through Ontario. I know my father's grandfather was a stonemason. Mm -hmm. came down uh, to Pennsylvania after after the Civil War. And, uh, you know, beyond that, on the McMaster side, I'm a little like, I know my dad did some checking at one point, but. Yeah, James you know, McMaster, he was born 1801, and he's the, the migrating ancestor, is, is what it uh, said. And so he married in 1830 in Ontario. So him and his wife, Esther Henry, uh, were in Canada. Okay. And that would have been uh, my grand great grandfather's father. Is that right? Where where are we at here? We've got my dad, Robert. My grandfather, Charles Royal. My great grandfather was his name, Marshall. So he's your second great grandfather. Okay. So, yeah, I was really hoping that we could find enough to hand it off to our Ireland project, you know, and have them mm -hmm. take a look at it and get it a little bit further. But once again, we did not have a, a location in Ireland <laughs> that we could look in and narrow it down to. And so um, that was as far as we got with that one. Okay. So did you gain new information that was interesting, Lois? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the... Uh... Of course, it's the New Englanders keep the record. Um, I was very pleased to uh, to get the connection with Rebecca Norse uh, confirmed. Um, and, uh, and the John Locke actually turns out to be kind of true in a very distant <laughs> So that was cool. Uh, but yeah, all the, all the ancestors I'd never heard of, you know, that didn't even appear on any of the bits and pieces of trees that I had seen in Ireland are really interesting crowd and of course the john adams connection who wouldn't you know although that's apparently not rare um, yeah and uh well, you and figure yeah. he has you figure he has a lot of descendants but i mean really your distance to him is is not that far off so cool yeah a lot of writing coves in my ancestry it looks like so did uh, did i get to show you this was the uh the typescript that my mother had oh okay that she had made of those diaries of uh, uh, Cynthia Locke Gerald and uh, Martin L. Gerald, uh, which have gone into the to the the Gerald family of New Hampshire in the Civil War chapbook, which I sent you a link to. When you put this stuff up, if you would put a link to the Amazon page for that uh, book, I would appreciate it very much. Yeah, definitely. It's got it's got the uh, there was uh, there was Martin's diary for eighteen sixty four. And uh, yeah, I've been reading some of the diary items, and it's just is. yeah, it's just fascinating the amount of detail. Sometimes you know they only had that little bit to write in for each day, and mm -hmm. so you know the entries were limited on what it could be. And sometimes you still really got a sense of how they felt during that era, or you know yeah, what was important direct. that it happened. Yeah, it's very direct and it's very you know unedited. Yeah, and. Uh, and it builds between the lines, you know, you begin to see the connections and uh, realize what must have been going on. <laughs> it's startling. And there's what the, the thing of the, uh, Samuel Gerald's uh, wartime reminiscence look like. And, oh yeah, the, the genealogy of Gamaliel Gerald. I do not have a uh, copy of the book itself, which was its slim maroon volume, but it was online, uh, which we found in the nice. I had a photocopy of yeah. it. Yeah. I was hoping one of the cousins um, had the hardcover book to show us, but I think they weren't understanding what I wanted to see. So <laughs> it existed at one time because I, I copy passed through my hands. I saw it. I had yeah. it. Yeah. I'm not sure who got it. But now that it's online, everybody's got it and there is no yeah. shortage. Yeah, and one way or the other, I know they all had their own copies, they said, 
um, you know, but I didn't get to see whether it was a, a hardcover, you know, a, a bound book or or a printed yeah. copy. It had a maroon cover. It's a little... Remember that. Very, very fascinating stuff. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, Lois, I'm sure you want to look through some of the ancestors on your tree. One of the great things about Wiki Tree. It was very good, and I did not peek in advance. So <laughs> well, you're free to peek now, you know, and I do love the story space that we have. And so, you know, not that we're making up stories, but we try and like bring these ancestors back to life for you and other descendants. Um, out of the documents that we do find. And so, you know, I hope you are able to find other really great tidbits. And then I'm going to send you some uh, PDFs on some of the stuff we did gather up for oh, the end here. I will have to send them on to my other relatives that are not plugged into this. They'll be interested, I think. That's great. Send it's it further down the line. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any questions of me? Uh, not at this time. Uh, I'll have to look over the material and, uh, and that should be fun. Well, thank you uh, so much for inviting me to this thing. I had never heard of it before and would not have guessed. It's, it, it's been our pleasure, Lois. Definitely. Very I'll good. talk to you later. Bye-bye.